It began with the tolling of a funeral bell amid a universal backlot masquerading as a boneyard in some land that is neither England or Germany, but is somehow both. Stark and gray with claw-like tree branches reaching up toward a streaked, joyless sky, it isn't until you watch these old films on an actual theater screen, I have, that you realize the set designers of the period really did manage to create a world that is a sort of alternate universe. These films were not made for small t Henry Frankenstein, Colin Clive, and his weird dwarfish assistant Fritz, Dwight Fryer, lurking in the churchyard, waiting to rob the grave recently filled. Afterward, they depart to a crossroads. The body of a condemned man still hangs from a gallows. Medieval, to be sure. Fritz doesn't wish to shimmy up the gallows and cut the noose, but does so anyway. Henry assures us these bodies are just resting, waiting, waiting for new life to come. Here we have the first stirrings of his mad dream. Brains, both Henry's and the monsters, play a significant part in this version of Frankenstein. So when one brain is rendered unusable, Henry realizes he must have another. The luckless Fritz is sent out to retrieve said brain from the Ingolstadt Academy, where a Dr. Waldman, Edward Van Sloan, holds forth for students fresh from the belly of the Roaring Twenties. Fritz sneaks into the dissecting lab, drops one damn brain, and absconds with one labeled abnormal. What the hell? It's all the same to illiterate horror movie hunchbacks. Meanwhile, in faraway House Frankenstein, Elizabeth, May Clark, and Victor, John Bowles, are worried by ominous suggestions in Henry's letters, all about forestalling a romantic reunion between himself and Elizabeth until he can complete his experiments. Taking their concerns to Dr. Waldman, Edward Van Sloan, they find out that not only is the subject of Henry's obsession to restore life not to animal but human subjects, but that he at one point asked Waldman to procure for him bodies, fresh specimens. The three of them pay an impromptu visit to the old tottering medieval tower wherein Henry has his lab. They pick a good time to come calling. The weather is wild and wicked, and Henry is flying kites in order to harness the the natural current needed to power his hulking flesh golem, the monster, Boris Karloff. Just when he thought it was safe to try and bring to dreadful animation the stitched together body he has made from stolen corpses, here comes friend, professor, and blushing bride to be. Henry proceeds with the project despite the unexpected interference. His kites conduct the lightning down to dynamos, sparking gadgetry, Tesla coils and other such bizarre apparatus, and the bandaged body is lifted to the opening in the ceiling via chains hooked to a dissecting table. Brought back down after the fireworks, the huge scarred hand begins to move slightly sending Henry into some pseudo-religious, apoplectic fit of blasphemy. Declaring famously, it's alive, in a near-pathetic nasal screech, he furthermore intones, now I know what it feels like to be God. Foreshadowing of future doom, we take it, never spit in the eye of the divine. The creature is revealed slowly, apparently. Women, at the time of the film's release, were so shocked by the Hideous makeup of monster artist Jack Pierce, they ran. From the theater screaming, but the modern viewer has seen the iconic Karloff as the monster so many times it will not really phase him or her, except for a certain cadaverous, dead-eyed close-up that suggests the pathos of the mentally deficient or physically malformed. Henry and Waldman confab, Henry quite pleased with himself and his success, Waldman informs him that, indeed, the brain inside that particular horror was a brain of a criminal, an abnormal brain. The monster is brought in for examination. 
Fritz comes in and scares the holy hell out of him with his torch. Remember this plot point for later, as Fritz is an undeniably sadistic and bitter little troll who seems to take delight in torturing poor Boris with the one thing the hulking brute really fears. Fire. A fear of the natural element, the god forces, from a creature unnatural to the birth cycle of creation. This is a certain metaphor. The fire is the divine spark, after all. 